Brian and I kind of had this idea for an end of the world kind of post-apocalyptic story. Last Man Alive, living in a emergency broadcast radio station built in like the Cold War era. Broadcast, just this rock and roll fueled show every day, all day, in hopes that if someone's out there, that they'll hear them. We thought it was such a unique idea, something that we were excited to tell people about. A lot of things felt like they were in the right place at the right time. I met Doug Powell while working on a film by a good buddy of mine, Tim Scott. Doug was kind of the comic relief in that film. We had the opportunity to work with him on a 40-hour film last Friday in April. At some point we were like, we really need to do Apocalypse Rock, and we need it to be with Doug. When we're writing scripts, they often have someone in mind, and for many films, we had Doug in mind. If Doug was not available, we wouldn't have written it. A lot of people are surprised when I say that Doug is not a you know, professionally trained actor. Doug was a comedian in an earlier part of his life. I make myself look more professional, and this, this company I'm working with, they're like, you need quotes from businesses to make it seem like people know who you are. So just as a joke, I wrote down that the Washington Post said, who? <laughs> That lends itself very naturally, not only to a comedy, but also to just filmmaking, being an actor in general. Doug and Brian have always worked really well together. Brian directed Doug in a way that you know, he knew what Doug could and couldn't do, and it worked well. There were always jokes flying, which was great, and Brian and Doug loved to kind of riff off of each other. Check! <laughs> yeah. 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 Doug took it seriously. He wasn't just there to joke around and you know wing it through the serious parts. He really brought it. This was a big project involving numerous people, a lot of um, planning. You know, we had things to learn about Indiegogo campaigns and raising funds. The $32,000 goal, that was kind of a high goal, thinking if we raise $32,000, we can pay everyone, do everything exactly the way we want it. Doug actually went on 98 Rock. It was on there for about two hours in between songs and segments. It was literally during that time when he was on the air that we were like, we have to launch the campaign right now. Over that month, we raised close to $9,000, just enough to do the production part. We knew that we were probably gonna have to raise money for the post-production, especially because we wanted to go with a professional post-production audio house. When you're talking about a movie that is about rock music and about a radio station, it has to sound good. We knew that the station itself was gonna be a character as well. We had talked about filming on location, but that wasn't really ever fleshed out because we knew it'd be cheaper and easier to build a station in a, in a space close to where we were making the film. Right here is gonna be the radio station. There's the generator. This is looking down a hallway. And then turning around the corner, down the other hallway, that's it. We put some feelers out for some production designers and we came across John Burgess. He's got a ton of work behind him. Like he's done sets for Survivor, a bunch of plays. He's a teacher who was going for tenure, and he said, I have to get some more work under my belt or just some, some stuff before I become tenured. He really brought his A game because he loves what he does. He coordinated the building of the set with Walter Berry, who constructed, fabricated the set, and, and delivered it. He brought a bunch of interns from school to help, you know, paint and dress the set. We gave him a budget, and then we also paid him. And but even he even used some of that money to. Uh, pay for other things on the project. This is fantastic. So this is the main area. This is the main area. I used to work in radio, and so I had this idea of the station that I used to work at in my head. So this is, it's nice to get in here. When your actor comes on set and is blown away or forgets they're on a set, that's always just helps them do their job better. A lot of the gear was, was loaned to us by good friends who have it's just gear that's way too old and not useful anymore, but we're glad they kept it. Oh, goodness! So much sound stuff! Yeah, a lot of this is Bethany's dad. Some of this is my dad. The main tape player 
the Panasonic CTF 900 tape player was mine. This bad boy actually uh, will still boot up. Wait, Brian, this is Unix. <laughs> I know this. <laughs> My dad used to have one of those reel-to-reel -reel tape decks, the Akai, and a friend had that in her garage and said, please use it, but bring it back. So we'd written the Night Owl. When approaching the script, we had uh, two characters. We had Tom Harper and we had the broadcaster, the kind of wild child, gonna live forever rock and roll guy, and then Tom Harper is the practical survivor. And originally we played that up a lot more. Instead of the night owl kind of picking him up and dusting him off, it was Tom Harper picking up the broadcaster, so it was gonna be like a split screen with two dugs. That's not Doug. Of course it's Doug, that's Falcon. Look at him. Chris. I love you, Chris. He's emotionally distant with me. It keeps me in check. We were gonna have him talk to himself, and it just wasn't working. The idea presented itself pretty plainly that, oh, the night owl should do it, because we'd already set up that he interacts with these tapes, so now, whether it's him losing it or, or whatever you choose to read into it, you know, he, he's picked up by his, his own devices. In the script, it was just an alternate tape he plays from that has a night owl written on it, and we saw that this piece of equipment in itself was a character, it became the thing that picked him up and dusted him off and sent him on his way. But that's where that character kind of came from, paying homage to the, the really old rockers up way too late. As with all of our Starwipe projects, we developed such a camaraderie on set and this was no exception. We had a strong team, we had people involved that had passion for the project. We had the usual suspects, star wipers, that we use a lot. So, this is a camera. This is just a BTS camera. We have another one for the actual shoot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we, don't, we, can't, we don't shoot with garbage like that, you know, for the real video. I don't know why we even rented this yeah. one. Yeah. But, I love you know, it. I'm not the producer, so... Yeah. Actually, I'm using the actual camera that we're using for the shoot. My parents were there, Annette and Earl Gill. Of course, we had the on-set child, who was Oliver Pennington, and his caretaker, Bonnie Pennington. <laughs> but in addition to the usual people, we also had Orlando Herrera, who we've worked with before in the past. He's someone we've known for a very long time, but he lives on the other side of the country, so... Or sometimes he lives out of the country, and so we... Uh, don't always get to work with him, but we brought him on special for this project because we knew that he would uh, just be amazing at being our cinematographer. The script went through obviously a variety of drafts, and at times we had kind of deviated from the rock, and it became a morning rock show, but then like an afternoon sports show, and then like a talk show. In a short film, you have so little time to do anything that you have to be like razor focused. So I ended up saying, let's just pack it with as much rock as possible. He's just a, a rock DJ. And people seem to have really responded positively to the soundtrack. When you have a film called Apocalypse Rock, you better have some rock music in it, right? I love the Doug Powell actually got us in contact with several bands that we ended up using in the film. My brother, was in several bands and so some of their music is in it which then got us in touch with some other bands so for the most part it came from those two sources the end song was written by someone that i went to college with his name's jeff eben and we called him and we were like hey would you be willing to write a song for the end of our movie? He brought us that song he'd already written, played it for us, I'm like, oh, this is perfect for Apocalypse Rock. He remixed it into an acoustic version, which uh, Tom Harper could have easily played. Into the ocean, this life. When he leaves the door, it transitions into the more studio mix version, like the soundtrack version. This love just made us hurt, and hurting's made us numb. So we touch from a safe distance, how alone we've become. Is it At the end of the credits, you hear it a third time, and that's like the really super mix version. Life was just a dream. Cut. <laughs> that was good. Great job.
The ending of this film was something that we debated about for a long time. Because we did identify the film as a comedy, we knew we wanted to have a positive ending. It was about the music, but it was also about being useful and finding something to do and being productive after the world has ended. He's approaching his two-year mark of being at this radio station, still moving forward. And the radio station ended and he was continuing to move forward. Oh, hey, what's up? Am I the 10th caller or something? Uh, did I win the energy drink, dude? What's up? And just, uh, less, yeah, what's up sounds really confrontational. Do more. <laughs> did I, did I, uh... Doug is so good at doing voices. Several people ask about that, and one person even said, so who did all the voices? Where did you find those tapes? I'm like, that's Doug. That's him? Oh, uh, hey, am I the 10th caller? Um, did I win the, uh, the energy drink? That was so good. <laughs> Before we close, I think we've got time for one more call. Uh, my girlfriend's been giving me, like, the cold shoulder lately. You know, and I don't mean... Denny is an Easter egg, his little sneak peek of his character from last Friday in April. A fan favorite. Heck, he's a Starwipe favorite. So it was fun to bring him back for a brief moment. Just getting into film festivals was exciting, but we're not only getting in, but we're we're winning quite a lot of awards. A lot of uh, best ofs, best narratives, best comedies, some screenplay awards. A lot of times people ask us, how did the world end? What happened? We don't really know. It wasn't about that. It wasn't about zombies or acid rain. It was about Tom Harper, and it wasn't about how he got there. It was about him surviving. I was trying to figure out how to abbreviate Apocalypse Rock. It says O A R K A Rock. But then I realized that it's spelled Ark. From the end of the world, this is W A R K Apocalypse Rock. We didn't want it to be super allegorical. We didn't want to go as far as like naming the character Noah. Someone actually at a film festival recently said, A R K, Ark? Like last film. I'm like, yes, you got it. It's, it's there. We didn't intend to make like a family film, and I wouldn't call it a family film. But so many indie films are really, like, not family-friendly. Don't go outside. We wanted to make it a fun movie that felt like you were skipping out of school to go, go misbehave or something. And at some of the more serious festivals, it really felt that way. After so many bleak films, it was like, you know, crack open a beer, let's start having some fun. It's just an overall wide audience that you can reach with this film. It's always bittersweet. It's good to see the finished product. The ride was a good one. Everything in terms of recollection, it was all good. You're never done, you just run out of time. So it's nice to finally uh, encapsulate all that art and effort and collaboration. It serves for me as a time capsule. You can go back and remember what you, where you started, where you ended, and what you learned in that process. I'm a firm believer in do what you do best and then surround yourself with other people who do what they do best and you have a common goal, and you guys kill it. And there isn't a project yet that we ha haven't work have worked on that we haven't just nailed it. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. And um, I don't know, I feel like family, I guess. We're never done creating, so there's always something new around the corner, and there's always small projects and things to keep us active, and we're really excited to see what we do next. Cheers! Cheers.